Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous video, we introduced the upwind method for solving the linear advection equation. Here, we're going to analyze this method's accuracy and stability. And the approaches that we'll take can apply more generally for analyzing numerical schemes for partial differential equations. When we examined ODE convergence, we defined the truncation error to be the amount that's left over when we substitute our exact solution into our numerical method. And we can make use of the same definition to define truncation error for partial differential equations. So, as an example, let's look at the first order upwind method for the linear advection equation that we introduced in the previous video. And let's look specifically at the case when c is greater than zero. So at a time point tn and spatial position xj, we can define the truncation error, capital T nj, to be equal to u of tn plus 1 comma xj minus u of tn comma xj divided by delta t plus c times u of tn comma xj minus u of tn comma xj minus 1 divided by delta x. And we can define the order of accuracy to be the largest p such that tnj is big O of delta x to the p plus delta t to the p. So now let's calculate the truncation error for the first order upwind scheme. Let's now look at calculating the truncation error for our upwind method. And the truncation error is given by substituting our true mathematical solution, u of t and x, into our numerical scheme. And at time tn and xj, our truncation error will be given by this expression, where this term is our first order expression for ut, and this is our first order expression for ux. And to calculate this truncation error, we're going to expand everything using Taylor series at tn and xj. So here we have a term at tn plus 1 and xj, and we'll make use of that tn plus 1 is equal to tn plus delta t. And here we have a term at tn and xj minus 1, and we know that xj minus 1 is equal to xj minus delta x. So let's go ahead and Taylor expand these two terms. So we'll have that this is equal to u of tn and xj plus the partial derivative of u respect to t, ut of tn and xj multiplied by delta t plus the second derivative at tn and xj times delta t squared divided by 2 minus u at tn and xj coming from this term and this is all over delta t and in addition to this we truncated this Taylor series after delta t squared so the first term we neglected was delta t cubed but we've got this additional delta t in the denominator, so that tells us that we have additional terms that are big O of delta t squared. Now let's look at the second term. We have plus c times u at tn and xj minus u at tn and xj minus u x tn and xj delta x plus u x x tn of xj delta x squared divided by 2 and this is all over delta x and again we've got terms that we neglected of big O delta x squared. So we see that there are now some terms that cancel away. So the u t n x j cancels with this u t n x j, and this u t n x j cancels with this u t n x j. 
and we're left with the following expression. And at order one terms, we have a ut plus cux, and we know that this will evaluate to zero because our mathematical solution satisfies that ut plus cux equals zero. And therefore, we're left with a term delta t utt at tn and xj over 2 minus c delta x over 2 u x x tn and xj plus big O of delta t squared plus delta x squared. And since we see here that our truncation error has leading order terms that are delta t and delta x, we can conclude that this is a first order method. Just like with ODEs, truncation error is related to convergence in the limit as delta t and delta x tend to zero. However, things are slightly more subtle here, since we have two spacings, delta t and delta x, that both need to tend to zero. And we generally need to decide on a relationship between delta t and delta x. For example, for the upwind scheme, we could take these two spacings to zero while maintaining that our CFL number nu, which is equal to C delta t divided by delta x, remains constant. And therefore, delta t and delta x would scale proportionally. By making this choice, we can ensure that our CFL condition will be satisfied for all delta t and delta x. In general, the convergence of a finite difference method for a PDE is related to both its truncation error and its stability. And we'll discuss this in more detail shortly, but first we'll consider how to analyze stability using Fourier stability analysis. So let's suppose now that our numerical solution, unj, is periodic on a grid xi. Then we can represent unj as a linear combination of sines and cosines, or in other words, Fourier modes. And equivalently, we could represent our solution as a linear combination of complex exponentials, since e to the i kx is equal to cosine kx plus i sine kx. And from this relation, we can deduce that sine x is equal to 1 over 2i e to the ix minus e to the minus ix, and cosine x is equal to 1 over 2 e to the ix plus e to the minus ix. We first develop stability analysis for linear PDEs, where we can express our solution in terms of a linear combination of components, each of which satisfy the PDE. And for simplicity, this allows us to focus on only one of the Fourier modes. So in particular, let's consider a Fourier mode with wave number k, and we'll consider the ansatz unj of k is equal to lambda of k to the power of n times e to the i k xj. And here, lambda of k is a complex coefficient. And the key idea is to suppose that unj of k satisfies our finite difference equation. And that will allow us to solve for lambda of k. And typically, for linear equations, this is possible. And the value of the magnitude of lambda of k indicates whether the Fourier mode e to the i k xj is amplified or damped. And if the magnitude of lambda of k is less than or equal to 1 for all k, then our scheme does not amplify any Fourier modes and will therefore be stable. So let's now look at performing a stability analysis for the upwind method and the central difference method 
for the linear advection equation. Let's now look at performing a stability analysis of the upwind method for the linear advection equation. And here our numerical scheme is un plus 1j is equal to unj minus nu times unj minus unj minus 1. And nu is a dimensionless constant equal to c times delta t divided by delta x. And nu has to be in the range from 0 to 1 for the CFL condition to be satisfied. So to perform stability analysis, let's try an ansatz that's equal to a single Fourier mode with wave number k. So we'll try the solution unj is equal to lambda of k to the power of n times e to the i j k delta x. And here lambda of k is the amplification factor associated with the wave with wave number k. And for stability, we want that all of the lambda have magnitude less than or equal to 1. So to find the lambda, let's now substitute this form into our numerical scheme. So we'll have then that lambda to the m plus 1 e to the i j k delta x is equal to lambda to the n e to the i j k delta x minus nu times lambda to the n e to the i j k delta x minus e to the i j minus 1 k delta x. And we can see in this expression that we have a common factor of lambda to the n e to the i j k delta x so we can remove that and we'll be left with lambda is equal to 1 minus nu times 1 minus e to the minus i k delta x. And we can now look at the values of lambda in the complex plane. So if we look now, we have three terms. We have a 1 and a minus nu. So those two terms together, that would sum to give us a point right here. And the final term is nu times e to the minus i k delta x. And as k varies, this exponential will trace out a circle and it will have radius nu. So we know therefore that our lambda values will lie on a circle of radius nu centered on 1 minus nu. And we can see from the diagram here that this circle will be contained within the region where the magnitude of lambda is less than or equal to 1, and therefore we can deduce that our method will be stable. So let's now look at directly calculating this. So to do this, let's first note that we can write lambda in terms of real and imaginary parts by exp expanding this to give us 1 minus nu times 1 minus cosine k delta x plus i sine k delta x. And let's now look at calculating the magnitude of lambda squared. So that will have real components, 1 minus nu plus nu cosine k delta x, all squared, plus nu sine k delta x, all squared. And we can now expand out these terms. So we'll have 1 minus nu squared plus 2 nu 1 minus nu cosine k delta x plus nu squared cosine squared k delta x plus nu squared sine squared k delta x. And we can see that these terms will combine together to give us nu squared and therefore we'll get some simplifications and this will become 1 minus 2 nu, 1 minus nu, times 1 minus cosine k delta x. 
And here we can now make use of a trig identity. So we know that 1 minus cosine k delta x can be written as 2 sine squared k delta x over 2. And using this identity, we can see that this can be written as 1 minus 4 nu, 1 minus nu, times sine squared k delta x divided by 2. And we can see here from this expression that we have 4 nu times 1 minus nu. That actually has to be bounded by a quarter. And this term has to be bounded between 0 and 1. So we can conclude, therefore, that this will always be less than or equal to 1 and will therefore have a stable scheme. The stability analysis also gives us insight into how our numerical scheme will behave. And for the linear advection equation, we know that if we put in an initial condition, then it should move with speed c as time progresses. And therefore, there should be no decay or amplification of any mode. And ideally, we would want that all of our lambda are close as possible to the line of magnitude of lambda equal to 1. So we can ask ourselves which modes of our solution are better reproduced by our numerical scheme. So let's, for example, look at a point here that is close to having magnitude lambda equal to 1. So that will correspond to small k. And that corresponds to long wavelength. So a component in our solution that looks like this, that has a long wavelength, will have slow decay and will be reproduced well by our numerical scheme. Let's now look at a mode that is here. So this will have high k. And specifically, we can see that this would correspond to e to the i k delta x is equal to minus 1. And therefore, k would be equal to pi divided by delta x. And that corresponds to a wave with wavelength 2 grid points. So in this case, we would have a Fourier mode that looks like this. And this would have fast decay. And therefore would be reproduced poorly by the scheme. And we'll take a look at a numerical example where we can show that these long wavelength modes are reproduced better by the scheme, whereas these short wavelength modes are quickly damped out by our numerical scheme. Let's now perform a stability analysis of the central difference method and compare it to the upwind method. So here, our numerical scheme is given by un plus 1j is equal to unj minus nu over 2 times unj plus 1 minus unj minus 1, and again, nu is equal to c delta t divided by delta x. And in this case, nu has to be between minus 1 and 1 in order for the CFL condition to be satisfied. So let's again try the ansatz of a single Fourier mode. And we have then unj is equal to lambda of k to the power of n times e to the i j k delta x. So if we now substitute this in to our scheme,
then we'll have lambda to the n plus 1 e to the i j k delta x is equal to lambda to the n e to the i j k delta x minus nu lambda to the n over 2 e to the i j plus 1 k delta x minus e to the i j minus 1 k delta x and again as before we see that there's a common factor that we can remove here so we'll have then that this becomes equal to lambda is equal to 1 minus nu over 2 times e to the i k delta x minus e to the minus i k delta x. And here we can make use of an identity and we know that this can be converted into sine. So this can be converted to 1 minus nu i sine k delta x. So let's now look at this expression in the complex plane. So again, we have the real part of lambda on the x-axis, the imaginary part of lambda on the y-axis, and we have this line here that denotes the magnitude of lambda equal 1. And we have two terms here that contribute. We have the 1 that will take us to this position, and then we have an imaginary component of size nu times sine k delta x and that as k varies these values will be between minus i nu and plus i nu and therefore our values of lambda will form a line like this and we see here, here that these are outside of this stability region and we can therefore verify this with calculation. So if we look at the magnitude of lambda squared that will be 1 squared plus nu squared sine squared k delta x and this is greater than 1 for some k and that implies then that this is an unstable scheme. Now, it's worth noting that the amount that this is larger than 1 is only very small and is a factor of nu squared bigger than 1. And we can see when we look at this line here that it's only just slightly outside of the disk. And that means that the, this particular method is only just slightly unstable. And as we'll see in a computer example, the method will only manifest its instability after we've simulated it for quite a long time period. We say that a numerical scheme is consistent with a PDE if its truncation error tends to zero as delta t and delta x tend to zero. And consistency is therefore a local property that tells us how our discretization will locally match with our PDE. And, for example, any first or higher order scheme will be consistent. A fundamental theorem in scientific computing is the Lax Equivalence Theorem, named after Peter Lax, a professor at the Courant Institute at New York University. And this tells us that for a consistent finite difference approximation to a linear evolutionary problem, the stability of the scheme is necessary and sufficient for convergence. And when this theorem refers to linear evolutionary problems, that essentially encompasses linear hyperbolic or parabolic PDEs. So, we know how to check for consistency. We can derive the truncation error. 
we know how to check for stability, we can perform Fourier stability analysis, and therefore from LAX we have a general approach for verifying convergence. Also, as with ODEs, the convergence rate is determined by the truncation error. Now, Fourier stability analysis has some limitations, and first, when we derived the technique, we made use of a periodic domain. However, it can be shown that the conclusions of free stability analysis on a periodic domain often hold true more generally. And therefore, free stability analysis is the standard tool for examining the stability of many finite difference methods for PDEs. Another limitation of the tools that we showed here was that we required linearity of our PDE and this allowed us to break down our general solution into a linear combination of Fourier modes. However, we can generalize the ideas shown here to nonlinear PDEs as well. And in this case, we can take a reference solution to our nonlinear PDE and then look at a small perturbation on top of that reference solution. And that small perturbation can be analyzed using the techniques of linear stability analysis. So now let's look at two Python examples for the linear advection equation using the upwind method and also the central difference method. And we'll take a look at how the results of these programs are consistent with their stability properties. Let's now take a look at the program transp.py that can simulate the linear advection equation ut plus cux equals zero over the periodic interval from zero to one. And we're going to make use of an initial condition that u of x at time equals zero is equal to a Gaussian centered at x equal a half. And we're going to solve this equation using the first order upwind scheme that was introduced. And here our numerical solution u n plus one j is given in terms of unj and also unj minus 1 and this formula involves nu which is a dimensionless constant defined as c times delta t divided by delta x and in our program we make use of m equals 64 grid points and we create two arrays a and b for storing our solution and we're going to output 40 snapshots of our solution and between each snapshot we'll perform 10 time step iterations and we'll create an array z for storing our snapshots. We'll now define some PDE related constants and we're going to make use of c equal 0.1. We'll define our grid spacing dx and we'll choose a time step dt to be 0 0.01 and we'll then evaluate this constant nu and in this case our constant nu is less than one and therefore our CFL condition is satisfied. We'll now define our initial condition which is equal to the Gaussian and we'll store it in our array A. Let's now integrate the PDE and we'll first loop over all of the snapshots and within that loop we'll perform the number of iterations that are required. We'll then loop over the spatial grid and perform the update according to the upwind formula. And since this formula involves un j minus 1, we need to evaluate the point that is shifted by minus 1 in index. And we also need to take into account the periodicity. So if j equals 0, then we need to wrap around and use the solution value at m minus 1 instead. And here we compute then the relevant index to use and store it in JL accounting for this periodicity. We'll then compute our updated solution at grid point j and we'll store it in our array b. Once we're done with all grid points then we'll copy the array b into our array a and we'll also store snapshots of our solution at the relevant time points. We'll then output all of the results stored in our array Z. 
So let me go ahead and run this program now. And by default, this program outputs all of its results to the terminal. And I'll now run this program again and save the results to a temporary file called out. And let me now use GNU plot to plot the results of this program. So I'm first going to look at the initial condition. And we see that we have this Gaussian that is centered on x equal a half. So now let me plot some snapshots of the numerical solution. And as expected, we see that our Gaussian moves to the right as we would expect for the linear advection equation. If we look at our program, we simulated for 400 time steps and we used dt equal 0 0.01 and therefore we simulated up to t equal 4 and since our speed c was 0.1 we know that our Gaussian should shift by 0.4 in total and we indeed see that our final snapshot is centered at x equal 0.9 which would be consistent with that shift of 0.4. We can also see that over time, the height of this Gaussian decays slightly. And that is expected and consistent with our Fourier stability analysis. We saw that all of the Fourier modes that make up our solution will decay slightly in time. And therefore, as time progresses, the height of this Gaussian will decrease. When we performed the stability analysis, we saw that modes of higher frequency will decay more rapidly. And we can test this now by altering our initial condition. And let's now add a high frequency mode to our initial condition. So we'll add in a term here of plus 0.1 times minus 1 to the i. And this will alternate adding 0.1 and minus 0.1 to our initial solution. So let me now go ahead and run this modified program. So in this case, our initial solution is now our Gaussian with that high frequency mode added on top of it. And if we now plot a few solutions for the output, then we see that the high frequency mode is rapidly removed from our solution. And this is a feature of the first order upwind method. When we are updating our solution, we typically will blur out the initial condition. And in particular, that blurring is much more substantial for higher frequency components of our solution. So in this case that we've been looking at, we've made use of values of c, dx, and dt that are consistent with the CFL condition. And now let's look at a case where we flip the sign of c to minus 0.1. And in this case, we have that the CFL condition is not satisfied. So let's now take a look at what happens in this case. So we're back to our initial condition here, and let's now look at the first few solutions. And we can see that the Gaussian is moving to the left as expected. However, we can see that an instability is starting to develop at x equal zero. 
and let me now plot a few more solutions. And we can see that that instability is now starting to grow quite rapidly. And if we plot a few more solutions, then we see that the instability has now completely overwhelmed the scale of our initial Gaussian. And our vertical scale on this plot now goes up to values of around a thousand. So one thing that you can ask is why does this instability happen at x equal zero? We're working on a periodic interval here and there is nothing special about the point x equals zero in our grid. The reason that this happens is due to the specification of our initial condition. We set our initial condition to be a Gaussian centered at x equal a half on this interval from zero to one. However, there will be a slight loss of smoothness of this Gaussian when we wrap around the periodic interval. And at the point x equal zero passing to x equal one, we will no longer have differentiability. And that loss of smoothness means that the instability in our solution first manifests itself there. If we were to simulate for longer, then that instability would eventually overwhelm the entire numerical solution. Now let's look at the program transp2.py that can solve the linear advection equation, but using the center difference formula instead of the upwind scheme. So here, our numerical update for un plus 1j now involves a second order center difference formula involving un j plus 1 and un j minus 1 instead. And as shown, this update formula is unstable, although only slightly. And we'll take a look at how this manifests itself in the results of this program. So the structure of this program is the same as transp.py. The only difference now is that we're going to simulate for longer. So we'll output 100 snapshots of our solution and we'll do 40 iterations between snapshots. And in our PDE update formula, because we make use of j plus one and j minus one, we need to find the indices of the points to the left and the right of the current j that we're considering taking into account the periodicity. And we'll output the results in the same way as before. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And I'll output the results to a temporary file called out that we can plot. So let's now take a look at our initial condition again. And let's now plot a number of the solutions. And we can see that the solutions look rather good. And we can also see here that unlike for the upwind scheme, the height of the Gaussian does not appear to decay over this time range. So now let's look over a longer period. So we can see that the height of the Gaussian is actually growing slightly from our initial condition. Let's look over a longer time period still. And at this point, we start to see that there are some small irregularities in our solution. Let's show now a range of the snapshots at a later point. So we'll plot from the 60th snapshot up to the 70th snapshot. And we can start to see that the solutions are becoming irregular. And if we simulate for longer, then 
the solutions become even more irregular. So by the Hondra snapshot, the Gaussian is hardly visible anymore. And this is consistent with our stability analysis. We saw that the center differencing scheme was only slightly unstable by a factor of nu squared. So it takes a while for that instability to manifest itself. And this is a important point in designing numerical schemes. Certain numerical schemes may actually appear stable at first glance, but may be unstable after a long time of integration.